I'm getting ready to do a new demo of some software, thinking of things Collection 3, Collection 2, and Collection 1. This is some neat old software from my childhood that I'm really excited to show to everybody. But before I can do that, I need to get my video split properly because I, getting my capture rig set up has been quite a process. And at the moment, I've got almost everything working except I don't really have a way to get VGA to my monitor and to my X capture card at the same time. However, I have a solution. Now some among you might be experienced with this and know that you can split the VGA signal because it's an analog signal. Just use one of these. One in, two out. The problem with that is twofold. One, there's a drop in quality. I guess maybe somewhere there's a high quality version of this, but that little wire with maybe eight conductors inside of it, three of which are critical and several of which are semi-critical, unshielded, the quality definitely drops going through one of these. Now, the X Capture has a VGA pass-through, but, well, you should see my setup. You see, here's the PC over here, and then we come all the way around, and there is the X Capture, all the way over on the other side of the room, right next to my big computer. That's where the video would have to go in. And the problem is, the Ept Capture is whiny. It apparently doesn't like the low video signal coming from the splitter, especially going over a long cable. In fact, I can't even get it to work reliably plugged straight into the machine with a long cable, so basically I can't get the video all the way over there. And I can't move the X Capture over here because my PC can't be moved and the X Capture won't work over a long USB cable. Seriously. All of that. This stuff ain't simple. It's why you don't see everyone doing it. So here's solution number two, a powered distribution amplifier. This takes the VGA signal in here. Yes, I got that backwards because my camera is mirroring the image. And then it spits it out here, 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 and here. And it reamplifies it. So this is a big, heavy box with actual electronics in it. Consequently, those electronics have to be powered. So because VGA is a low voltage signal, it's only, I think, maybe a volt or two peak to peak, you don't need much of a power supply. Well, you don't. These people apparently do, because this thing takes 17 volts AC. Now, that's a devil's number. There's no reason for that. There's no earthly reason this could need 17 volts AC. In addition, it's 17 volts AC center tapped. What, what does that mean? If you put 17 volts into this, it wouldn't work. If you put 17 volts DC into it, it really wouldn't work. But if you just put 17 volts into it, it either wouldn't work at all or it would blow up because this is not actually a 17 volt device. This is 17 volts center tapped. Basically, center tapping is a way of getting both a positive and a negative voltage out of a transformer at the same time. Uh, it is a economical way to use one of the simplest electronic components in existence. The problem is they tend to be very special. They tend to be custom. They tend to be application specific. Fortunately, in this case, this one is not terribly rare. So here's the juice we need. This guy here really should do it. So if you look in the upper left corner, it says 16 volts AC. Now, we don't need 16 volts, we need 17 volts. Okay, so I'm gonna use a little electrician's trick here. Um, those values are bullshit. It says 17 volts, at 17 volts nominal. It's 17 volts at a given current. And it's 17 volts at maximum output. If I were to plug in four VGA outputs, then it might need the full throughput. But because this is a plain transformer, not regulated, not a switching power supply, it's not going to put out 17 volts. It's going to put out, with no load, probably 20, maybe even more. And that device doesn't really run on 17 volts. It runs on voltage, and it'll stop working when it stops working. So because that's such an analog device, I'm not worried about giving it exactly the voltage that it wants. It will take what it needs, and I suspect it will do just fine with it. It probably has a voltage regulator. It probably doesn't need all those volts anyway. Now, the other thing that's critical about this is it has to be a center-tapped transformer, but fortunately, this is one. I rummaged around the bins at the VPC, and I was able to find a center-tapped transformer. If you look in the back, you can see CT right there in the middle. That's center tap. So L1 is the first side of the winding, L2 is the other side of the winding, and then CT is the center. So this will probably work, but probably ain't good enough. So we're going to put it on the bench, we're going to power it up, and we're going to see what it really puts out. So this is a very simple test we're going to do. All we're going to do is just check the base voltage output from this thing with no load on it. So to do that, we just plug it in and then put a multimeter across the outputs. 
Now it would be very hard to do this with it directly plugged into a power strip because it has no cable on it. So I'm just going to put an extension cord on there. It also makes it a little easier to unplug in a hurry in case something goes wrong. Okay, we're on AC, ready to go. I've got it over there, just in case. Plug it in. And there it is. All right, so let's talk about a few things. First off, you'll notice that this is 9.2 volts. So since this is a center tap transformer, that means that there's going to be another 9.2 volts on the other side. And if we were to connect between them, we would get 18 and a half volts. That's considerably more than it's rated for, so what's going on? The answer is this is not supposed to put out 16 volts. 16.00. That's not how these work. The way these work is this thing puts out a given voltage at a given current. This thing, when it's at its rated output current, is going to sink down to the expected voltage. The other thing I'm going to point out, look how much variation we're getting here. This is bobbing all over the place. Well, that's because there's probably, if anything, one capacitor on the output of this in order to smooth out the ripple and this meter is not true RMS and it's probably getting a pretty sour notion of what's coming out of this thing because it's, it is changing over time and this isn't sampling at the same rate that this is changing. This is changing at 60 Hertz and this is sampling you know once every quarter second or whatever so who knows what this thing is pulling at but it's probably not pulling fast enough to get a, an actual notion of what voltage is coming out of this but we can say for sure that this is something above 9.2 volts most of the time. With the understanding being that this guy here was not expecting to get 17.00, I promise. And I'm probably going to open it up so I can demonstrate that, but most likely the input goes straight into a voltage regulator. And usually those voltage regulators can take quite a lot of swing, so this is probably going to be cool with 20, 30 volts in reality. We don't want to push our luck, but all the same, the truth is that it could probably handle it. So I'm going to go ahead and unplug this from the other end, not this one, because then I would be really close to AC while I'm trying to unplug it. I'm going to pop these guys off now that we no longer need them clamped on for safety. And uh, we're going to check both sides just in case. Plug this back in. Let's check between the sides. All right. Yep, there's our 18.5. There's our 9.25. Yep, as expected. So, this will work for our purposes uh, as long as this thing isn't cooked. All right, now I'm not going to go all jewels per coulomb on you here and do a piece-by-piece -piece tear down and analysis of the whole thing, but I am going to pop the chassis off and let's just see what it is we're working with. Once I have a Phillips head. All right, correct implement acquired. Okay, well, it's not the correct implement. There are different sizes of Phillips head. You need the right one. There we go. That's a pH1. That guy's a pH2. Most things are pH2. pH1 is relatively rare in comparison but you got to keep one of these around because otherwise you'll just completely destroy the head on that when you put it back in and you'll have a hard time getting it out to begin with. I want to point out, by the way, these Weha screwdrivers. I don't know, probably some other high-end ones, but look at this. That's not magnetized. It just friction fits that well. That's a little magnetized. Okay, I lied. But anyway, trust me, when these were new and they weren't magnetized, they still, they still gripped really well. And if I... If I try and wiggle this, it just, it won't go anywhere. And these aren't expensive. You can get these on uh, Amazon, uh, 20, 30 bucks for a whole set. It's worth it, I'm telling you. It'll make life easier. Back in action. Yeah. So this is that mid-90s, early 90s construction style. Beautiful, massive, expansive, wasted printed circuit board. All right, let's get in here. All right, now, first things first, like, I know I got other things to pay attention to, but man, what are these? I'm so curious. There's these three sets of dip switches. Oh, no, there, is that them? Four, five, six on, high gain. I don't know. And uh, just for confirmation, this is from 1993, or 94, I guess. It is interesting to me that there are three distinct blocks of components in here, but there's four outputs, which makes me think that this architecture is not one functional block per output, but actually one functional block per 
color channel. I think that's RGB. That is a beautiful construction. These are totally identical and that's a pretty cool way to build that. The only problem with it is that if one of those outputs sinks considerably more than the others, then the others will be dimmed at some point. They're not fully isolated. Whereas if you used four amplifier blocks, one for each output, then one being screwed up or even shorted couldn't affect the others. But I assume that in practice that was not a problem they ever really encountered, so they chose not to use that approach. All right, now we got in here to answer a question, so let's answer it. What are these devices doing to the input voltage? And they're doing exactly what I expected. That is a 7805C. And this other component over here, this boy, is a 7905C. And do you know what those do? Those are standard voltage regulators. What a voltage regulator does is it takes the input voltage coming in here and it compares it to a known reference internally, I think a Zener diode usually, and then it adjusts its output continuously using a simple linear analog feedback circuit, I believe, uh, so that the output is always the same voltage no matter what the input is. This puts out 5 volts all the time. And this puts out negative 5 volts. What the hell does that mean? What that means is this voltage coming out here, if you were to measure between the output of this and ground here, you'd see 5 volts. And if you were to measure between the output of this and ground, you'd see negative 5 volts. The reason for that, I believe, is that VGA goes above and below the zero crossing. So there's both positive and negative voltage there. Um, I haven't looked at a VGA signal on an oscilloscope in a long time, but I, I see no reason to think it wouldn't be that. So things like this usually need both a positive and a negative voltage inside. And there's two ways to do that. One of the ways of obtaining both those voltages is to create an artificial ground. I'm not enough of an EE to understand how that works. And my understanding is that that's kind of a tougher approach than the alternative here, which is to get a positive and a negative to start with. When you use a center tap transformer, you're getting a positive and a negative because the center tap in the transformer winding becomes your ground, and then the voltages on either tap are going up and down like this in relation to it. So when this one is positive, this one is negative, and so on. So as a result, you get that negative voltage that you needed without having to do any work. So these are 30 cent parts, then this external power supply they bought from some company that just makes power supplies, and all this is just a transformer. This guy here, this, this monolith, that block right there, that's a bridge rectifier, and that's basically four diodes in a trench coat. And what that does is it takes a, a single AC waveform coming in, and it spits out a positive and a negative. And what's odd about that is, why would they use a center tap transformer and then feed it into one bridge rectifier? Oh, that's going to haunt me. Yeah, you know, uh, I'm not confident enough to actually proceed with this until I dig in some more. I need to get under that board and figure out how this is wired because I don't know what the pinout should be over here. And if I get it wrong, I'll destroy it. It's AC, so there's no intrinsic polarity to the input coming out of the transformer. The only important thing is that we get both the legs on the leg pins, and we get the center tap on the center tap pin. Alright, let's get at it. I didn't mean to ruin it. In sheet metal, especially old, often seemed pretty crusty. I mean, they had to tap it, and I don't, maybe the taps over and over and over, they ended up, so they grind those threads. Yeah, there's a theory. Alright. And we're in. First off, this pin going nowhere, that pin going nowhere. Are they connected on the top? Nope. So this pin and that pin, I think, are totally disconnected. I don't think they go anywhere. This is not a multi-layer board, so what you see is what you get. Analyze this from a monkey's perspective. What do we see that looks significant? This is where the pins for the DIN connector, the power input, land. And what I noticed right away is that the middle one seems to go nowhere, these two seem to go nowhere. I looked on the top and there's, there's nothing here. If we follow these up, you can see that both the outer ones go somewhere. Where do they go? There and there. And that is the power switch. After the power switch, this leg and this leg get handed off to this leg and this leg. We follow those around and they land here. 
smack dab in the middle of the regulator. Sorry, diode bridge. So there's our AC waveform right there going into the rectifier bridge and then out of there here's our positive leg of the DC. Comes around here uh, which is a short jump on top over to a, a capacitor it looks like probably. It's close to one anyway. And then, ah uh, yeah, there's our filtering capacitors that filters the ripple from the uh, AC being converted to DC. The negative side of that bridge rectifier comes out and hits the center on this 7805. And then the output from that is this guy here, and then uh, this pin here would be ground. It's going into the solid ground plane on the other side of the board. It also goes to the capacitor. Ah, okay. So both these capacitors are spiked into ground, uh, and they're uh, serving to regulate, or uh, to smooth both sides uh, of that circuit. So then this here goes into that capacitor and that capacitor goes there and it comes down to the voltage regulator that's putting out the positive 5. Alright, so there's our power supply. Uh, we got filter caps, we got a bridge rectifier, and uh, I'm an idiot. Apparently the center pole of the transformer doesn't get used at all. I'll admit I'm not the best at this positive negative voltage stuff. It uh, it throws me for a loop, but we've got enough information. We have enough information to proceed. We know now that that pin and that pin are the positive and negative, sorry, are leg one and leg two of the transformer. Uh, we don't care about hooking up the center except to ground, it looks like, and that corresponds to the outside two pins, which are definitely this one and this one. We're set to jet. All right, we're back together now. I'm not going to put the top on because I want to poke around inside of this while it's running and figure out how it works a little bit more. But 17 volts AC is not very dangerous and unless I put my tongue on something I should be fine. By the way, these three guys here that I was curious about, those are quad op amps. Other than that, the only stuff in here is some basic logic. This guy here is an octal buffer slash line driver and this guy here is a quadruple OR gate. Yeah, I don't really know why this thing has logic on it at all, considering that uh, it appears to be a purely analog instrument. I don't know what those do. Now the next thing we need in order to get this thing hooked up to power is we need something to fit that jack in order to get power into it. As it happens, that's a MIDI plug. Now an important question about this before we go hacking it to pieces, does it actually have the wires that we need? Alright, this seems to have everything we need. Alright, there's all bare wires, now we just gotta meter them out figure out what goes where. Here's an important question. Is the chassis, is the outside of the plug, which is connected to the outside of the box, almost for sure, is it connected to anything other than the ground shielding? Okay, so here's the answer. It's not connected anywhere. That sucks. That's our wiring. We're going to use yellow and black. So assuming that I was right about everything, which is always in question, then this thing's ready to go as soon as we get these nailed down. Now, the one thing that sucks is that these wires are real small. If this thing really does pull a significant amount of current, like if I were running it with all the outputs connected at once, then this could end up being outright dangerous because this is potentially going to melt this wire if I put too much current through it. Now, as someone who's experienced with electronics, I've decided to take the leap of faith in assuming that that's not going to happen. But if you don't know what you're doing, if you're not confident that you can detect a situation like that before it escalates and starts a fire, I can. But that's because I have a lot of experience doing this and I have a feel for stuff. If you don't have that, don't do this. Don't mess around. Get the right product or get someone who is experienced to build or test or verify whatever you're going to use before you use it. Don't mess around with this stuff. It doesn't matter if this is a little tiny device. This thing could start a fire and you could lose everything. Another thing I'm going to point out is because the center tap is hanging off of this bare braid here, because I have no choice about that, uh, it's exposed. And that shouldn't be a problem because it's on a transformer so it's isolated from anything else. But it does mean that if you were to go like this, 
you could hit both sides. Now again, it's only 17 volts total, and here here it's it's only nine volts max. There's no reason to think that you'll be in danger, but just think about it. Think about what could happen, especially if you're working with higher voltages. If this was a 30 volt, 40 volt transformer, God forbid 120, you would not, do not take this chance. You want, find something else. Find another cable. Don't do this. This is because this voltage is low enough to be safe, and I know that because of experience and no other reason. Okay, now we've got this built, and we're not done being safe. We have more testing to do. We have more questions to answer before we plug this thing in. Why is this so complicated? It's complicated because I'm working with something I've never seen before, for which I have no schematic, no diagram. I have nothing other than my wits, my experience in this field, to tell me how to safely hook this thing up. But that's not enough. It's not enough. You, you, it doesn't matter how experienced you are, you can make dumb assumptions. So what you want to do to be safe, even if you're an experienced electrician or an experienced electrical engineer, working with something you don't understand, you need to check and double check and double check. And to do that, we're going to do a couple things here. First, I'm going to turn the power off. That's on, that's off. I know it's off because it shows on the front that that's off, and we can trust that any push button that's in the outside position is off. Because we read the bottom of this board and we figured out how this is wired up, we know that the moment the power comes in, it goes straight into this. So we don't need to worry about any of these electronics getting juice when we plug this in as long as this power switch is off. It's a true power switch. It doesn't come after the voltage regulators. That's an option that some devices could do. It's a terrible way to do it. So it's very good that this comes right there at the beginning when the AC comes in. That means with this off, that when we put power into this thing, nothing's going to happen right away. And we're going to be able to check on the back of the switch and make sure we're seeing what we're expecting, which should be that 19 volts AC. Another thing the power switch is good for is we can turn it on and turn it off right away. Because it takes time for components to blow up unless you massively overvolt them. If I put 120 volts into this thing, no bueno. You're not going to have a chance to, to redo that error. Uh, you're you're going to be fucked. But because we're working with low voltage and relatively low current, we're probably going to be safe to turn this on even if it's wired backwards or cross-wired or something. In the worst case, we'll blow the breaker on my power strip, but usually operating at the voltages we're talking about here, things don't blow up so much as they overheat and that takes a few seconds. So we should be okay. Now, what we want to test when we turn this thing on, two things. One, is there AC voltage in the right place of the right voltage? Two, once we turn the power switch on, does DC voltage appear where it's supposed to? Power's off. Contact. Okay. Right away, where's the voltage? Whoops, run DC. There's our 18-something. Okay, now we're just going to turn this on for a second. Okay. Now, I saw, I saw a light here. I'm going to turn it on again. Okay, yeah, so the light came on which is a good sign. Now we just want to check the DC rails and to do that what we need to do is to get one of these probes grounded and then we're going to poke the other one in right here and we're going to see what the voltage coming out there is and uh, we're just going to turn this thing on for a second while we do that. Five on the dot and then this guy here should be negative five same place but it's not it's 6.3 minus six minus five twelve there's five. Okay so According to the 7905, yeah, well, the 79XX series, it's uh, ground input output. So if I check on the left pin to the right pin, I should get what I want. And so now, let's look at the 7805. Oh, God, yeah, it's wired differently. It's input, then ground, then output. So, uh, eh. All these years, I could have sworn the 7805 and 7905 were wired the same, but, uh, yeah. That's what assumptions do for you, right? Anyway, here we are. Uh, this thing's done. Uh, it should be ready to use. Uh, everything's probably... Oh. Hi. Hello. Uh, you're not helping. He has no respect for me. Fine. You're so dirty. You've got dust all over you.
Love you, Gibbs. Goodbye. Anyway, we've gotten the answers we sought, so let's go ahead and clear some stuff out here and let's test this thing. That looks pretty good. So I'm going to flip a bank of switches in here. And the image gets noticeably brighter on the blue channel. And the next batch, that's the green channel. And that's the red channel, of which there isn't much. Yeah, so there you go. That's going to be one switch per output, I believe. We can verify that. Move this cable to the second output, and we're going to see if only the second dip switch affects it. So these dip switches inside allow you to set the amplification for each of these channels so that if these two are low gain because they're short runs and these two are high gain because they're long runs, you won't have to set them all at the same time. Fantastic feature. And that does confirm my thoughts about how this thing worked. Red, green, blue. Each one of these is a functional block. And these are quad op amps because they're taking one signal in, bridged across all four inputs, and splitting it to four outputs. And by the way, the reason that you see two output, and four output, and eight output, and sixteen output devices, but you never see a seven or a three for things like this, is because these don't come in threes. They come in twos, they come in fours, they come in eights. They don't come in odd numbers. And nobody builds this stuff out of individual components. Maybe they did in the 60s, but now, and by now I mean any time after the 80s, People just buy off-the-shelf parts, so it would be kind of silly to put in a quad op-amp and then not put in four jacks. And it would be particularly silly to put in another op-amp that has multiple outputs just to put in a fifth jack. So they use as many as the standard off-the-shelf parts to provide, and that's why you end up with these orthogonal devices. The company that made this didn't make anything. You could have made this thing. If it were 1994, you could have bought the parts for probably a tenth or a twentieth of the cost of making this device. But the problem is, they're small. They're real small. Yeah, I know from an electronic standpoint this ain't real small. It's not surface mount, but it's still... It, you can't just twist wires onto these. But if they were big enough, you could. 